Hi, it's Father Jerome Krug here. I'm going to be having a conversation today with Father Stephen Jones, talking about what the early years and early months of priesthood are actually like. Which I'm really interested in because I was just ordained uh, a priest just three months ago on June 29th. Um, so kind of in the first couple months of my priesthood, yeah. um, been a beautiful experience so far. Um, yeah. Just... Actually, I first met you, Stephen, back when I was finishing my second year of theology. Now we call it configuration. Um, when I was at St. Charles. Yeah. And, and I was, I was a middle school teacher at St. Charles, um, at the time. And so we didn't really over, overlap a whole lot that summer because you were doing Kind of the parish stuff and i was a teacher in the school but then yeah in those couple weeks before you went back to rome and and when i was you know just starting i guess my i think it was my second year of teaching at that point um yeah there's a couple couple times we you know were able to interact at the school yeah. at the parish yeah. and yeah i think i remember one time coming into your classroom mm -hmm. which at the time i would have never remembered for any particular reason but it's funny now that things have come full circle, looking back at that moment. Yeah. I didn't go into all the classrooms, but. Right. Yeah. But you came to mine. I know. Um, Pretty cool. And, and, you know, at that time, I was kind of, I was attracted to the idea of the priesthood. Yeah. But it wasn't, you know, something that I was uh, really acting, you know, taking concrete steps at that point. Yeah. But like every exposure and inter interaction I had with anyone that was kind of involved in the church or involved in, you know, priesthood or yeah. priestly formation was just like another kind of data point for me of like, oh, wow, okay, this is something I could, you know. So, I, I mean, I remember yeah. I remember uh, that as well. Um, and shout out to our good friend, Father John Paul. Father John Paul Lewis, yeah. Big part of that summer for me, big part of your time at St. Charles. Yeah. Um, it's always good to have priests that you can kind of turn to yeah. and, and look up to. And, um, so, yeah, you were ordained this June 29th. And this June 29th was, for me, five years of priesthood. Yeah. And uh, some days I'm not sure if it was five years or five minutes. It's gone by so fast. Or 15 years. Sometimes. Or 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of wild to think. Because, I mean, I, I guess I started seminary. My first year was, I think, your last year of seminary. I think so, yeah. Um, I was just ordained a deacon that year. You, yeah, you yeah. were ordained a deacon in 18. September of, of 2018. And yeah. I started in September, or I guess August of 2018. And so, yeah, we kind of, we overlapped for a little bit in the seminary together, yeah. not too awful long. No. Uh, and we were at different seminaries at that point. But um, yeah, like five years has gone by. I mean, yeah, I can think back on it, and, you know, in the blink of an eye. Yeah. Um, you still would have been at Kenrick. And I was at Kenrick. Five years ago. Yeah, it's in St. Louis five years ago. So what do you remember about your ordination day? Yeah, no, it's, it's a little it, more fresh than mine. Little, yeah, a little bit more. Fresh. We'll have to dust off the cobwebs for years, I guess. No, for my ordination day, uh, I actually, you know, kind of like to back up. There's a lot of planning, right? And you know this. There's a lot of planning that goes into, you know, planning and ordination um, with your family. You know, inviting all your friends and coordinating with your home parish and your pastor you know, to, to get the first mass of Thanksgiving and, you know, there's a lot of coordination with the diocese and just all that kind of so stuff. So many moving parts. So many moving parts. I, I compared it to planning a wedding, yeah. but without, you know, your fiance to do all actually the work. do all the work <laughs> and help you. And so, but I mean, thanks be to God. My mother was, she yeah. was a, a champion when yeah. it came to like helping to, you know, plan plan my ordination, you know, even, even, you know, kind of taking it, taking it far in a lot of circumstances. So like one, I remember one time she asked me, what color do you want the napkins to be at your reception? So many I colors said, for Mom, napkins. Mom, like I, you know, God bless you. I do not care. Like we just need to get it all. <laughs> but it was a really beautiful time of preparation. I mean, even all the practical elements of planning a wedding yeah. or, or planning an ordination, wedding yeah. ordination. Right. Um, the, yeah, because it was helping me to like process just a little bit more that something life changing, something big is happening here. Uh, 
Yeah, and so in that just kind of a company that helped actually, I think, in some ways to help this spiritual preparation for my ordination mm -hmm. um, of just really trying to enter into, uh, yeah, this, this reality that my life was going to be completely different. It wasn't yeah. going to be my own in a lot of circumstances anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was going to be the Lord's. It was going to be the church's. Yeah. Um, belong you know, to laying, the bride. Yeah, belong to the bride, laying laying my life down for the good of the church, for the good of the bridegroom. Um, and so, you know, the, those I, I remember the last couple weeks of, of preparation actually pretty well because um, I, I arrived back from my last year of seminary formation in Rome in early June, and then my ordination wasn't until the end of June on June 29th. Yeah. And so that was a lot of, you know, time back in the diocese, back at home, in order to just really enter into that those proximate yeah. stages of preparation. Um, I was even able to go to one of my best friend's ordinations the week before. So good. Mine. So good. Yeah. And it was it was like I was getting to live my own ordination a week before without having to like you know, say anything, <laughs> say anything or like think what's next or, you know, anything like that. Am I going to trip on my L? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No, I was just able to like enter in and like pray yeah. actually with the ordination, yeah. right? Uh, the week before, which was wow. a really, it was a grace, wow. um, which, which helped that week of ordination in a lot of ways for me to just kind of calm down and, and focus specifically on the spiritual aspect. Right. Um, so I remember all actually, the practical stuff was taken care of yeah. and you can just begin spiritually to prepare. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, and, and ordination day ends up being a long day. It's a long day. Yeah. And I, I remember, you know, the night before, um, I stayed at the cathedral cause I just, I, I wanted to, to be on site the morning of yeah. without having yeah. to like wake up, worry about my alarm getting not there. going off yeah, or, you know, yeah, yeah. getting there, driving there. So I woke up, I had a full night of sleep. I didn't mm -hmm. wake up once. Like I woke up and I was, I mean, a little nervous, like nervous yeah. energy of just like wanting to do it. But um, yeah, like just able to like pray and pray the office and and just get ready. Tell the truth. How many hours of the breviary did you pray that morning? I think I prayed all the way up to evening prayer yeah, that same, morning. Just same. To, just, I was like, I know as soon as I leave this room, yeah. I'm not going to get back to like 9 p.m. Right. So. Daytime prayer came at like 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> for me too. Um, and yeah, no, I was just well, able to to kind of take that morning, like eat something and dude, just same. sit and like talk with, there was a couple of my good friends that were also staying at the cathedral from yeah. out of town. Yeah. So I was able to like sit down and have breakfast with them That's awesome. at the kitchen table that morning and like actually have a cup of coffee and yeah, um, yeah and so then getting ready for for the ordination like you know vesting and the back sacristy at the cathedral and uh you know everyone else is moving around and they're you know they're they're kind of in a good way running running around like chickens with their heads cut off of like making sh it, it was a humbling experience actually of like they're doing this for me yeah um like they're really concerned about you know making sure that everything goes really well and in a large part, like for me. Right. Um, so then I remember like going out, lining up with, you know, the whole procession and behind the other deacons. Behind the other deacons in front of the, the priests. priests. Um, and I was I was so the, the two deacons in front of me were were deacon friends of mine from the seminary. And then the two priests right behind me were priest friends of mine from the seminary. And so we were just like talking and like you know almost like you know nothing big was it was just like we we're same friends old, same old. hanging out yeah um but i remember like the procession starts moving and walk into the cathedral and immediately just overwhelmed by i mean the music was beautiful superb it was it was packed with yeah. people from every stage of my life like every i knew everyone in the cathedral yeah people um, from saint monica saint elizabeth and seton saint yeah. charles yeah uh, from, i mean university from rome yeah. from oklahoma state from north dakota north dakota from the university of mary in north dakota exactly yeah. um 
And just like halfway up the aisle, um, I had to almost like pinch myself of like, I, I, I cannot, I cannot lose it right now at the very not yet. very very beginning not like, yet yeah at some point you know it's gonna happen let me get to my chair i just need to get to my chair for <laughs> i need i need to like uh yeah just like yeah and it was just it was overwhelming seeing everyone in the cathedral was was from some point in time in my life and being able to then weigh my life down as a priest in front of the church of oklahoma city and all my friends and family from every point was just, it was, yeah, the most special day of my life. Yeah, it's beautiful. So what about yours? Yeah, five years looking yeah. back on it. Um, Actually, getting to spend the fifth anniversary of my ordination at an ordination, kind of like you were talking about with your classmate the week before yours, uh, was actually the best way to reflect on the gift of the priesthood yeah. and to enter into it in a way that you're not preoccupied with, like you are on your own ordination day. Yeah. There's a lot you're preoccupied with. Um, no, but yeah, I was actually not ordained at Our Lady's Cathedral. Me and my four classmates, we, the cathedral was under renovation and so we actually um, got ordained at St. Mark's in Norman. But ironically, or maybe coincidentally, I stayed at the cathedral the night before mm. um, with one of my best friends from seminary. Nice. And uh, I remember thinking, it's gonna be a long day. So I wanted to do two things. I wanted to get three hours of the breviary parade. Yep. <laughs> and then the other thing was I wanted to eat a big meal. So me and my buddy, we went to Hatch at like six in the morning, wow. right when it opened, first people in there. And I got the kitchen sink. Oh my gosh. Delicious. That's bold. It was good. It was good. I, I knew I wasn't going to eat till like dinner time. Yeah, so. that's fair. Um, yeah, just like the little memories of that day that yeah. stayed with me. Um, nothing profoundly spiritual, but uh, just how special the day was. Yeah. Uh, and then the ordination itself, and then standing in line, giving first blessing. Yes. Oh my gosh. So powerful. Yeah. Um, like I think we stayed for like two hours. Yeah after the ordination mass. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably like the most powerful part of the day for me was um, after finishing First Blessings at St. Mark's in Norman, my buddy from seminary who was kind of driving me around making sure I could see straight. Yeah. Um, we get in the car and drive from there to St. Monica's mm -hmm. and I'd arranged with Father Hamilton to hear the confessions, yeah. but nobody else knew. So like nobody knew. So there I was, I'd been a priest for maybe three or four hours. Yeah. And I was sitting there in the confessional and person after person just coming in, having no idea mm -hmm. that the priest on the other side of the screen didn't know what he was doing. The, on, the <laughs> only thing that would tip them, tip them off is the smell of chrism. Still yeah, seriously, hands, literally right? yeah. still there. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and then I remember getting out of the confessions after like an hour and a half. And I remember getting in the car and just like being profoundly overwhelmed mm -hmm. by the fact that the people whose confessions I heard believed that when I used the words of absolution, that it absolved their sins. Yeah. Like I always believed that the sacrament of, of reconciliation was a source of forgiveness of sins yeah. for me and for everybody. But the fact that like, I, when I had I said those words the day before, nothing would have changed. Yeah. Uh, and then saying them that day, literally only being a priest for three hours, yeah. that the people's faith in the sacrament helped me to have faith in the sacrament of my own priesthood. Yes. You know, like I had a hard time believing I was a priest. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, and that actually transitions into, I think one of the, not a struggle, but just one of the, you know, maybe growing pains of like growing into something that's brand new. And you see this with every walk of life, uh, you know, a newly married couple or just like starting a new a job new teacher. somewhere, a new teacher, like those first couple weeks or months, it's going to be really difficult for the person that's experiencing everything in a brand new way mm -hmm. uh, to believe almost in themselves yeah. In a sense of like what they're doing there is actually kind of working or the right thing. 
So I mean, for me, I had both that experience as well of like, yeah. but almost in a, yeah, a humorous way of like, I remember the first confession I heard and then uh, my massive Thanksgiving on that Sunday, thinking the same thing after both is like, well, hope that worked. <laughs> I guess this I, is I guess this real. happened, <laughs> you know, and it, but like the, it has been a source of grace of like continuing, continually revisiting uh, those moments of like asking for the same level of faith that the people in the pews or the yeah. people coming to you yeah. have uh, in in you and your priesthood and me and my priesthood. Uh, because like, I know me, I know that I'm a sinful man. I know that I'm not worthy of, of the priesthood. And we're just doofuses. And, yeah, right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like that God has like, chosen and decided that like you know in, in order to show the world that uh my grace is sufficient for the world i'm going to use these doofuses yeah. in order to yeah. like achieve... lest you think it's actually them exactly <laughs> right in, in, and if in, anybody has any doubts about this just talk to our siblings right they will tell you the straight clear up, up any truth. any you know 100 percent right. doofus and it actually is the faith of the people of god that helps me believe in the sacrament of my own priesthood. Right. It's such a blessing. No, it, it deepens, deepens yeah. uh, my faith in God working through me that, yeah. that I can, I can tell after people, you know, like come for counsel or they come for any of the sacraments mass, uh, like people deeply and truly believe that what, like the words we're saying, yeah. like actually, brings Jesus into their lives yeah. when, uh, you know, we've been, we've been going to mass for, for 30, more than 30 years now. Yeah. We've been, you know, experiencing the sacraments for more than 30 years. And like, yeah, I, I think what you're saying of like, I a hundred percent trust that when you celebrate mass, if I were to go to your mass, uh, yeah, hundred percent Jesus yeah, shows no up. Doubt. And if you switch it and it's like, I show up, it's like, I know me, like I've never been able to do this before. Yeah. Uh, and so now like with the very simple, like laying on of hands of the archbishop and the words that he says to like the prayer that he says, we're priests forever in the line of Melchizedek. Uh, it's just, it's hard. It's like, yeah, it's a growing pain of like growing into that and just like having the yeah, I guess the the confidence in yourself, the confidence in God working through you that the people like see and believe, yeah. you know? And it's so good to have reminders that the people's faith is not in me, but in the priesthood. Yeah. And it's actually, it's not like a humbling thing. It's actually a relieving thing. Yeah. Because it's a reminder that they aren't coming for me. And so don't give them me, first right. of all. Right. But second of all, that I don't have to like perform. I can right. simply do what the church, my bride, has taught me to do yeah. for the sake of our children, you know, as a spiritual father. I, I remember being about the same point in priesthood that you're in now and sitting in the confessional and somebody like 50 years older than me asking for marriage advice and calling me father. Right. And I'm just sitting there. Thank God there was a screen because I'm just like, what? What are you asking me for? <laughs> yeah. Oh. But sincerely, like, like somebody 50 years, my elder saying like, father, what, what can I do? Yeah. And in that moment, feeling like self-conscious and like, oh no, what, what do I say? Like, I don't, I, yeah. and then realizing like, oh no, it's not Jerome. Yeah. They don't care about Jerome. They don't care about Stephen. No, not at all. Like they want a priest. And same thing, like when, when I walk into a hospital room and it's not someone that I have a existing relationship with, like a parishioner and, um, the sense of calm that comes yeah. is not because Jerome Krug walks no. in. Like, who cares? No. You know? 100%. Uh, but the fact that the, that the priest walked in, that Jesus is there. Yes. Um, yeah. And on the flip side, uh, we have both had similar experiences. I know you shared about this at the Archbishop's Dinner, uh, where actually just a couple weeks before yeah. you gave that talk, I walked into a gas station and on cue and 
the, I'm wearing my collar and everything, and the young lady behind the counter is like, hey, can I ask you a question? And here I was thinking like, it was gonna be a question about the church or faith or suffering or something. And she goes, are you a waiter? <laughs> I was just like, that happened to you too? Wait, I don't think I knew that. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe I hadn't told you. Because when I, I, I mean, that happened to me the day before, the day of the Archbishop Center. Yeah, yeah. I was buying a new pair of shoes and I walked in to Dillard's and they, yeah, the, the guy who was helping me, really nice, like yeah. had a great conversation. But he asked me, I was wearing my collar, asked me if I was in the restaurant business. Yeah. And I was, I was so taken aback that I didn't, I didn't even answer that I was a priest because I was just, I was almost You're flabbergasted like, what? that like, yeah, I mean, the, but like it, after thinking about it afterwards, uh, yeah, and, and your experience too, like people don't know Jesus, they don't know the church, and they don't know the symbols of the church. This the, is one of the most recognizable symbols in the world, I, I would have thought. Right. And people don't have any idea like what it means. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, it was, it made me sad. It was, mm. it was people, um, yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, there's a deep hunger for the truth and for goodness and for, there's an implicit right. just like desire in their part for God, but they don't know how to express it. What really stood out to me in that moment is that hunger's there and you know, we, we don't wear this because it's particularly comfortable. It's actually not comfortable, especially in Oklahoma summer. Yeah, what and do you mean? we don't we don't well, wear it. I don't it. know what you mean. Yeah, yeah right? right. We don't wear it because it looks cool or looks stylish. It, it looks rather kind of goofy, sometimes mm -hmm. even frumpy, because these shirts are not made for people. Nope. And they are made for some other person, some kind of being with yeah. a different shape and form. Right. But uh, I wear this not because I want to, not because it's something I enjoy, but because. I want it to communicate that I'm here for you. Yeah. And the fact that that symbol was like a broken symbol, like it wasn't communicating what it was meant to in that moment, that, yeah, are, are you a waiter? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, um, and I was, well, my response to this lady was like, actually, no, I'm a priest. And she's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Wait, that, and yeah. Uh, and uh, it kind of, you know, which is so what does that mean? You can tell it's like, I don't know what that means. But, exactly. You know, I'm I'm kind of embarrassed now and I'm I'm just not gonna like probe any deeper. Right. Uh, well, and I think, you know, because we're both you're one year older than I am. Yeah. And both in our thirties now. Uh, two youngest priests in the diocese. Two youngest priests in the diocese. Yeah, I mean you had that title for five five, five whole years. Five years, yeah. Um, so you're welcome for, <laughs> for taking that from you. But uh like you know, I'm aware of it every Sunday, um, you know, like just how young I am because in whatever whatever church I'm celebrating in, most of the time I'm one of the youngest people people in there. I'm like, oh, most of most of the our generation, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, yeah, they're not there. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's uh, so sometimes I think I experience this like, Again, like wearing my collar out in public. Uh, yeah, just being more acutely aware of like how different I look and how different like everything about this like symbolizes mm -hmm. uh, because so many of like, you know, friends and family and, you know, aren't there yeah. with, with us, which yeah. is also, yeah, it's, Sad, but also like, yeah. There's there's a sense of hope and, and a joyful hope of yeah. of preaching the gospel. And, and the, the the idea that it's the restaurant business or being a waiter actually says that this still communicates some kind of service mm -hmm. and um, a sense of like it still communicates that I'm here to serve you, but without any of the context, um, which is actually like paradoxically really powerful yeah um you know if we were walking around in like really expensive business suits people would treat us one way but we literally look like we're there to refill water yeah and clear plates and that's actually communicates something of what we are there to do mm -hmm. i mean symbolically yeah um 
I guess we do serve at the Eucharistic table. We, but, yeah, we do. But, not, yeah, but that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm yeah, not trying right. to say. I'm the, we are there as men of service. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think something I've come to realize over the last five years, um, like I said, feels like five minutes, is that really one of the best things I can do as a priest, since it's not Jerome Krug that people are looking for, it's the priest of Jesus Christ, mm. is to be radically available. Yeah. To be radically available and wearing a waiter's uniform as it's now come to be, you know, it, it's actually not like a power symbol, you know, like in medieval times or earlier in the 20th century, it could have been a very much a power symbol, but now yeah. it's actually a symbol of service. Yeah. Um, Which and is just, good. Yeah. That's good. Absolutely. That it's been emptied of like all kind of like false, uh, yeah, symbols of status or power or yeah. privilege or anything like <laughs> right that that is not the case anymore you know it's like the walmart vest that says how can i help you so yeah you just mentioned that you uh, yeah been ordained for five five years five feels like years. five minutes yeah um i guess i'm just wondering like how has the priesthood been different than what you thought it was going to be mm. when mm. you were ordained and also yeah. maybe like how has it been how has it been better than yeah. what you thought it was going to be? Yeah. I think anytime you start something new, you have like a vague expectation and it's never what it actually is, yeah. you know? Um, for starters, I don't think I could have possibly imagined how loved I feel mm. by the people of God. Yeah. I mean, just like cherished and valued and appreciated and, um, it's funny, sometimes people will say something like, I know you don't hear it enough, Father, but thank you so much. And I'm like, I honestly, I, yes, you guys are so good yeah. at telling me how much you appreciate the ministry of the priesthood that for some reason, you know, God's invited me to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a little bit more of the expectations versus reality. Uh, Father John Paul Lewis told me a story about Bishop Condorla, Bishop of Tulsa, uh, his ordination homily, I think it was this past year, maybe the year before. It was something along the lines of like, he gave this beautiful treatise on the theology of the priesthood and being another Christ and, and, and celebrating the mysteries of our salvation and proclaiming the gospel of Christ's victory over sin, death, and suffering. And then at the end of it, he gets like really quiet and has like a pause and he goes, but at the end of the day, it usually is just a lot of emails and meetings, <laughs> which, which is honestly true. Like, I think the priesthood is not just a bunch of like one-on-one -on -one ministry yeah. or just sacraments all day long, right. which is sort of what as a, as a layperson, even as a seminarian, as a, as a layperson, as a seminarian, it was just like, that's kind of what you expected. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of just actual kind of regular work stuff yeah. attached to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. As I... You've you know, seen that already? A, a little bit, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it, it, and yeah, that's not what you expect at all. Like, even in seminary, when you have your seminary summer assignments, you're kind of shielded from yeah. a lot of the administration. Right. Um, you can't do it. You can't do it. Uh, you're not experienced in doing it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, like, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, those meetings and those emails, uh, while not, you know, uh, what you thought it was going to be, like that is how you love the people by keeping the lights on, by keeping the, the air conditioner running in mm -hmm. July, you know, so people like we can actually have mass by uh, making sure that, you know, the campus is safe, by making sure that, you know, it, the church like looks presentable, like all those things do add up to uh, and like lead towards what everyone thinks, yeah. you know, the priesthood is, yeah. uh, you know, sacraments all day long and, you know, counseling, whatever. Right. Uh, it can't, yeah, that, that stuff, I won't say it can't happen, but like it, it is facilitated by mm -hmm. the necessary administrative tasks. Yeah. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean that like it's all, it's not super, super fun. Like right. we didn't, we didn't get ordained priests to do that. Right. Uh, but, there is like a, a joy 
in doing them because you realize and this doing is a good job. Yes, and doing doing a good something, job. doing it well, and doing it for the sake of the people that we're there to serve. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think for me, I you know, just being ordained for a few months now and getting ready to go back to Rome. Um, yeah, I think the thing that I, I thought, or really, yeah, I, I think I just expected, like, you know, administering the sacraments, doing the sacraments. I thought it was going to be like, maybe maybe not explicitly, but implicitly thought that it was, every time I did a sacrament, it was going to be like Jesus, where he felt power go out from him, <laughs> right? Uh, or like a spidey sense. A spidey sense that, okay, I've, I've done something. Yeah, done something like feeling here. the absolution leave your hands or right. something. Yeah. Which, spoiler, it, it's not like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe there's like there's an the extraordinary human emotion. Grace. Yeah, there's, there's human, human emotion. emotion. And, you know, I, there are some saints who have been blessed with the ability, like Padre Pio comes to mind of like, you know, there's that, yeah, he just is able to perceive what's really yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, but again, that kind of, goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of like, that's an invitation, uh, number one, to uh, be lost in wonder at, at the, like, God choosing very, very, very simple ways in order to bring salvation to his people through bread and wine and oil and water. And, and doofuses. Doofuses. Uh, where... Like those are the simplest things you can imagine, and those yeah. are the things that that God has chosen to enact His, you know, salvation for people. And, num and number two, that's an invitation for us to increase our faith. That when we can't, most ninety nine point nine percent of the time, when we can't perceive that something's happened or changed. Yeah. Yeah. That's an invitation to trust and have faith that uh, the Lord is present and working mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the sacraments teach us to have faith in God's action because God uses the simplest things and sometimes like the least exciting of things to bring about his new creation, Yeah, you know? Um, yeah, and changing gears a little bit, before you go back to Rome, have you experienced any priestly whiplash yet? Like, for example, going from the most joyful oh. of moments to the hardest. Like the other day, in the course of an hour and a half, I was in an ICU doing an emergency baptism and went from that to a meeting with a college student to talk, or a college graduate, recent college graduate, to talk about discernment. Yeah. And then after that, to say mass for a group of mostly retired people wow. for our Sarens Club in an hour and a half. Yeah. And it's just like, the whole course of what you can go through in a day as no, a yeah. priest. Yeah. No, I, I yes. Uh, there have been a couple times like that so far. I remember once, yeah, I got called to the ICU, and the person, yeah, like, in tremendous amount of pain, not necessarily, like, danger of death, but uh, was was not completely in their right mind. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, just, it was kind of a bizarre experience from right start to finish and so I, I left the ICU after anointing and everything like that uh, just kind of like what just happened and then got back to st. Charles for school dismissal and so all the, the you know the kindergartners and the first graders who are just like super happy are walking by and hi father Jones like have a good day and so just like experiencing like whiplash of what just happened to this is awesome. Like yeah. kids are great. Um, I remember, yeah, a couple times like heard some like hard confessions mm. and then have to turn right back around and celebrate uh, a week, a weekend mass. Yeah. And like, or, or have a really hard confession and then like they leave and then two seconds later, someone else comes in. Yes. No, and it's yeah. like, okay, reset, reset, reset. That's hard. Like wipe the tears, wipe yes. the tears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, and then to try to not impose what you're feeling from the last confession on this person who's coming in for their, you know, two-week right. regular checkup confession. Right, right, right. You no, know? And, and that that's, that, yeah, that's Something you don't easy. expect. Something you don't expect. Yeah. Like you, you, yeah, yeah, I just didn't, 
until you experience it, right? You have no way of like knowing that that's coming, that that's mm -hmm. happening. And uh, and you mentioned it too, just two seconds ago. The transition from like an hour, hour and a half of confessions into celebrating mass. And so I did not expect it, but just like switching your gears from like total focus and attention on one person to like presenting the mystery of faith yeah. and sacramental signs to a church full of people. It is such a weird, it, that's like a priestly whiplash moment yeah. too. Yeah. And, and again, yeah, until you kind of experience that, there's no way that you can even remotely know that's coming, but just another opportunity for the Lord to like remind you that uh, my my grace is sufficient for you, for everyone else. Like you are the instrument in my hand that is, that is you're like the scalpel in the hand of the surgeon. Um, yeah, just a beautiful reminder from, from the Lord in those moments that uh, he's the one working through us. And it, it's not Jerome, it's not Stephen that's, yeah that's providing anyone salvation because uh, I, I can't do that. I don't right. know if you can, do, can you do that? <clears throat> no, definitely no. Okay. not. Right, yeah. Not even my own. Not even my own, yeah. So you're getting ready to go back to Rome. You know, yes. we, we both had the great gift of yeah. um, being able to study over there and do some of our seminary formation there. Yeah. What's one thing you're really looking forward to getting back to over there? And uh, like, for example, uh, I would definitely uh, be looking forward to a granita di cafe. Oh, just um, sort of. De Oro. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Okay, it's good. like uh, it's like uh, it's like a granita from uh, like Aspen. Aspen coffee. Yeah, yeah, very similar to that. Kind of like a snow cone, snow but coffee cone, flavored yeah. with really good whipped cream on top. Yeah. Uh, but what's something you're really looking forward to experiencing there, and what are you not looking forward to leaving here? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'll start with the thing that I'm not looking forward to. Um, after going through seminary for six years and. A fifth of your life. Fifth of my life, yeah. Uh, it's a long time. Finally getting ordained a priest and being back in the archdiocese to then go back and be a full-time student. Um, Rome's full of great graces and blessings, and I'll be with you know, some of my friends who are also priests now, which is a great, great joy. Um, but just to be away from the diocese after you know, like this kind of culmination of yeah. priesthood and now to, to go back. One thing that I'm really looking forward to, um, yeah, is just like the uh, <laughs> La Dolce, Dolce Vita <laughs> of of uh, eating like pasta, like some of the, some of my favorite yeah. pasta dishes that haven't had in in a few months now of like carbonara. Right. At, there's a really wonderful restaurant just right around the corner from uh, where I'll be staying that. Hopefully I don't gain 300 pounds when I when I go back, but. You do lots of walking, right? Do lots of you walking. You gotta walk up that hill to the end. Right, and then walk down it, you know, five minutes back. So. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't know, so that, that that's what I'm looking forward to, not looking forward to. Mm -hmm. um, I think really like being back with some of my best friends from the past five years you in can't Rome. Can't beat that. Can't beat that. Um, and now we're all priests, right. and so to share, share that joy of being together is gonna be, gonna be yeah, great. Absolutely. So I'm curious, I, like just your time in Rome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What we was just missed like? each other. We just missed each other by one year. Right. Just missed. Right. Each, yeah. Like you left in the spring of 2020, COVID. Right. And then I arrived in August of 2020. Yeah. Still during COVID, but just yeah, a just few months. Ships in the night. Kind of crossed yeah. over the Atlantic. Not quite. But not quite. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. What was you know, any any. Favorite memories, things that stuck out, blessings. Yeah, what was your time in Rome like? The time in Rome, what was actually so powerful about it was uh, a long list of things. But what stands out to me the most at this point in my priesthood is how much the culture there and just the sheer distance from home, both geographically mm -hmm. and culturally, um, has made me a better priest. Yeah. Most people probably wouldn't describe me as patient, but they should have known me before going to Italy. Mm -hmm. Being in Italy taught me a, a level of patience that I could not have mustered on my own. Yeah. And a level of seeing the church, not just through the lens of our experience here in the United States, 
people or through our experience here in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. but seeing the universality of the church yeah. and realizing that as a church, as the church in the United States, we have a lot of expectations of ourselves because we have a lot of resources that other parts of the world don't have. And it's actually like been a good reminder of like, oh yeah, there are doofuses in all parts of the world doing this job and not worrying about some of these things I think I need to worry about just right. because I'm so influenced by our context. Right. And so in a certain sense, being over there was really freeing yeah. and uh, prepared me very well for the flexibility that's needed in the priesthood. Yeah. Because to be a priest, you have to uh, remove yourself from the center of your life and ideally put Christ there, but put Christ there in the form of his people. Yeah. And being able to be in a different culture ha helped me to see uh, how much I was, how, what it's like for me to put my perspective in the center. Um, and so that radical availability we were talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. that what the people need most from us is not even us, but for us to be available because of the ministry of Christ Jesus working through us. Yeah. Um, and being able to just fight tranquilo, <laughs> you know, like yeah. just be calm, as the Italians would say, yeah. uh, is something that aids me, not just in my own walk with the Lord, but in my ability to lead others in their walk. Um, yeah, the, the pace of life there is actually like, in a certain sense, yeah. well, it's frustrating when we're used to our, yeah. our pace, but actually it's soothing and maybe even like restorative. Yeah. Um, and you can see that even down to like the manifestation of how slowly the Italians walk, like they walk and they're looking around, they're taking everything in. And if you're trying to get to class because you're running late, yeah, that's, that's pretty frustrating. But it, it does teach you something of like, you know, the important things in life of like, I mean, they really value family. Yeah. They value relationships. They value, uh, yeah, just being able to, to experience life without rushing through it um, and take everything in. It, yeah, that's one of the best lessons I've been taught. Which isn't even from the seminary. There. No. It's just from the culture. Yeah. And I mean, I, I am terrible at uh, practicing what I preach and I'm terrible at implementing what I've learned. Uh, but if we were to live our priesthoods um, going slowly, um, realizing that uh, God's pace is probably a lot closer to that mm -hmm. than the pace that I tend to want to live my life at, yeah. uh, how much more uh, apostolic fruit there would be, but also just like apostolic rest. Yeah. And that we could rest in the mission and, and not just simply uh, be busy, yeah. um, which I think is, is not good. Not good, an occupational hazard of, yeah. I think the, the uh, yeah, like American uh, like mindset of like, go, 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 go to yeah. the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, gotta get stuff done. And when that yeah. gets applied to the spiritual life, yeah, you know, yeah. We're, we're a toaster strudel yeah. at that point. <laughs> A toaster strudel. Okay, can you elaborate? Uh, you're just toast? To just toast. And okay. you're a strudel. <laughs> okay, well, Father Stephen, it's been great to chat with you a little bit, share about our experiences, and, and hopefully the people of God can, can benefit from it. Um, I'm blessed by your priesthood, by um, just simply not being the youngest priest anymore, but seeing, seeing uh, it, speaking, not seriously, seeing... Um, more priests come after me. I know I'm just at the beginning of that experience, yeah. but it's it's revitalizing. Um, if you're somebody who is thinking about the priesthood, please uh, go to okcvocations.com and read up on that. And if you want to talk, please reach out to either of us, reach out to your parish priest. I will be happy to, to accompany you. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, blessed by your priesthood. And yeah, uh, just a constant reminder that the Lord is still at work and in calling men to be his priests uh, into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. All right. God bless. Okay. I really do got to run. I have a wedding. <laughs> you have a wedding? Yeah. At 12? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Five years of priesthood.